The Air Force chief jumped up. He said it will be crippling. He said, Mr. President, the first strike will be crippling. He said it in English. He meant that a first strike by Israel would cripple our Air Force. The commander-in-chief told him, if you let them strike first, you will fight only Israel. But if you strike first, you will have to fight Israel and America. But the war fever in Cairo had become unstoppable. Popular hatred of Israel, which Nasser did nothing to discourage, now swept him forward and drove other Arab rulers to his side. Even King Hussein of Jordan, for years at odds with Nasser, decided he could no longer stand aloof. In the morning, I got into my uh, aircraft and, uh, and flew to Cairo. And I was met by the president. I was in uh, military fatigues uh, with my gun uh, on. And he said, well, I see you're carrying a gun. I said, I've been like that for the last few days with my troops. And then he made a strange remark. What would happen if we suddenly took you prisoner and uh, denied uh, all knowledge of your arriving in this country? Soon after, King Hussein signed a mutual defense treaty with Nasser and agreed to put his army under Egyptian command. We were on the verge of a, uh, uh, of a war. Therefore, any reservations I had uh, in the past to uh, any troops coming into Jordan were removed as far as I'm concerned. So Israel faced the prospect of war on three fronts, from Jordan in the east, from Syria in the north, and from Egypt in the south. That was the time when Auschwitz came up. It never happened before. When people spoke, they said there was a feeling we are surrounded, we are surrounded, no one will help us, no one is helping us. And God forbid if the Arab armies invade us, they'll kill us all. By this point, Israel had been mobilized for more than two weeks. All males aged 18 to 55 were called to serve. Most vehicles were requisitioned. Most factories closed. Israel could not stay fully mobilized for long. But still, Prime Minister Eshkol waited for the international community to do something. He came to military headquarters to remind his generals of America's warning. Israel must not go it alone. He told us that they were making diplomatic efforts in the U.S. and Europe. They were trying to reach a deal with Nasser. It made no sense to us. Flanked by Rabin, Eshkol found himself surrounded by generals insisting on a preemptive strike. General Peled was usually pretty quiet. Now he was shouting. He was actually shrieking. Why do you hesitate? Why are you afraid? I said, Eshkol, you have the best army since King David. If you don't attack, you will never be forgiven. If you do, you will be the conquering hero. To regain the confidence of his generals, Prime Minister Eshkol appointed a new Minister of Defense, Moshe Dayan, hero of the 1956 Suez War. Because the number and the, of their forces is bigger than ours, but still, uh, I hope and, uh, that we can make it, but much depends, very much depends, upon where the battle is. The generals also asked for another envoy to be sent to Washington. The prime minister agreed. He said, listen, Mayor, 
You go to Washington and find out what's going on there. Are the Americans organizing a naval task force? Is anybody going to do anything? When? Amit's mission was to see if the Americans planned to open the Straits of Tehran or if Israel would have to act alone. The Pentagon had quite enough trouble in Vietnam and didn't want another war. The director of the CIA made it perfectly clear. There is no international naval force. There are no American plans for action. There is no task force. So the head of the Mossad, Israel's intelligence agency, called on the Secretary of Defense. 